fine. Um, the videos are very tiny um, when they do show up. Because they even things like we didn't yeah. ha we didn't do closed captioning in part because the videos were so small that the captions would have taken over the video, right, and yeah. we didn't really have the option. Um, you know, like YouTube now or Vimeo, like they have great captioning options, but right. that really wasn't available yeah, to yeah. us at the time we yeah. created it. So I think there's that rethinking element, but also I think, um, you know, we, we had started off with the dorm room, but the dorm room wasn't the only space in which those kinds of moments or conversations happened. So some people were at their, at work talking with us, like yeah. at the office, which we didn't really have accounted in that particular piece. And then there were a number of people who um, were either at a suburban campus or even at the Loop campus. So like talking Lincoln Park to Loop or Loop to yeah, Lincoln yeah. Park and vice versa. So there still was, there was a campus feel, but it was a different kind of campus feel than having two people in the same room. Um, so I think for me, I mean, we, we might have carried out the spatial metaphor, but perhaps made it so that it section felt like you were living in a given room or space mm -hmm. and that they would be different spaces. Um, but I think also there's something to play with in terms of sound that we didn't really do because, you know, in further reflection, some of the things that would happen is because you're, you're talking with someone virtually, they're either talking too loud or too softly, like they've got people around them. So it's like this very hushed conversation or, you know, they think that you can't hear them. So they're basically screaming into the webcam and so like those kinds of dissonant moments I think if there were some way to better represent them like in the lived experience of, of the web text I think that that would probably be the move we would make with it wow cool yeah and that brings up the next question I mean that that you all sent us which is the one about curation too I mean that that's been hovering behind like, you know, you're talking about how the sound doesn't, or the video doesn't work now, or, um, so how, how do you think about this piece continuing on to live, you know, where it is on Kairos? I mean, what, if it could be archived in the best possible way, how would that work for you? That's a good question. Um, you know, I... I don't know, I, I, I would ask Pete and Katie about this too in terms of what their thoughts are. Um, I know I still have a lot of the original videos, so the unedited Ooh. stuff. Uh huh. You know, because, because the clips that we did have when they were working um, in the web text were very short. Um, yeah. And so we were, we were focused on specific moments. So things like, you know, people laughing or someone getting up from the table, walking over and answering the door and coming back. Yeah. How, to, how to use non-directive strategies via webcam tutorial like uh -huh. it's, it's a bit more difficult to have those kinds of conversation moments and so um you know I, I don't know if it would make sense to have some kind of archive of those clips that we had but perhaps in somewhat of a higher resolution although I I don't know how high resolution we actually have just because um we were using Camtasia through webcams right uh, yeah but I imagine it would be better than um, in there. So I think that the video clips, I mean, in some kind of way so that they're held on to, um, in terms of the other parts, I, I'm not sure how that would happen. So, um, you know, I, I don't know what even the flash splash page interface will look like in a few years, because depending on the device you're using, it probably won't, won't work. It won't yeah. be compatible at yeah. all. So there's the potential of, of losing of losing that entry point into the text. Um, so in some ways, like it, it brings up the question of do we just let it be? Because like on a certain level, it would order to make it sustainable, or it would require a real flattening where it's just the text yeah. and links to the video clips, yeah. which would be an entirely different kind of experience. Of yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be that original text. So we're just going to have to find 2009 with the text on it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had a long discussion about this in a dissertation defense um, the other day about this kind of degradation and the limiting of text. And it was, it was a real interesting discussion because it was a, a defense about um, 
anxiety about bodies given what's happening with books and, and the dissolving of books. And so it was hard to separate out that discussion from how people are thinking about bodies, but that's something else. So, so um, we're coming close to the end of the 20 minute mark. So the last question is, what are you working on now? Okay, so what am I working on now? Um, maybe I can invoke the other web text here. So I'm right now I'm I'm working on a book project and the book is print, which is really weird. Well, because you're working on tenure, right? <laughs> I'm not. Yeah. So um, so I'm doing that, and it's weird. It has nothing to do with my dissertation, which was digital. Mm -hmm. um, but the book is on autism, and so it's it's interesting to kind of go back to that authorism web text just because yeah. I think it was interesting to me that it got published. It was some of my earlier thinking. Um, and Cheryl Ball, um, really helped me get that published. Um, because it had started out as a seminar and then I took it at, um, I took it into DMAC, um, with the help of Cheryl, it went somewhere, um, beyond DMAC. Um, but I keep going back to it because it's it's interesting to me how stuff that I felt like I had dropped for a little while has suddenly resurfaced in different ways um, in the book project. And I, I think for me, started out um, trying to make a list of all the ways in which clinicians say shitty things about autism. So like looking at like you know the, the horrible horrible rhetorical maneuvers of clinicians. But yeah. it's really come back to this question of you know authoring in the sense of what do autistic people do? So what do mm -hmm. autistic activists do? What is an autistic rhetoric? And and I think that in some ways that that web text plays at that in ways that I had forgotten or maybe wasn't even consciously realizing I was doing when I had yeah. created it. So things like, um, there's a whole section where I start out by saying these are the ways in which I'm not autistic and it's just like a blank right. page. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the following pages have this list of things that are playing with like the symptom clusters that are supposedly attached to it. And um, so I've just been thinking about that a lot, you know, and, and thinking about how that kind of poetry manifests itself in autistic blogs and autistic embodiment and other spaces. And so it's been really, really, I guess, charted a kind of trajectory for what I'm working on now. But how do you, um, cause you're working on a print project. Yes. And so I'm curious how you think about, the affordances of what you were able to do online or, um, you know, people who are autistic, their uses of video and what's been happening on YouTube and people um, getting themselves to be seen and heard and claiming spaces, how that helps you think about print and vice versa. I mean, what the limitations are, what, how you see pushing against print to do yeah. what you need to do. So that's a really good question and a hard one, um, because I think at first, when I realized that I would have to do a print project um, for my book, like there was a sort of mourning period yeah, for me, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just because, I mean, disability activism is so richly multimodal, and I mean, yeah. there's just, it's really hard to think of ways to account for that and honor that in print spaces. Um, and I think there's also a certain inaccessibility about print, accessibility about print too, yeah. that isn't necessarily present in multimodal. It forced me to think more concretely, strategically, and pragmatically um, about voice in terms of how I write uh -huh. and also the accessibility or inaccessibility of voice. Because even though this is a project that, you know, ideally will enable me to have tenure, um, I'm still, despite it having an academic audience, I'm still trying to find ways to conceptualize this beyond the academic so that it would be the kind of text that other autistic people would read. And I think in some ways that's what marks the text as distinct because most academic books about autism are authored by non-autistic people for non-autistic yeah. people. Um, and that's not what, I have no interest in, in doing that. Um, and so there's a, there's a heavy narrativistic element to it, like a kind of, I mean, I, I would characterize it in many respects as being autoethnographic or mm -hmm. auti ethnographic, mm -hmm. um, which I think also it's, it's a long tradition in terms of not only autistic activism, but disability activism and disability writing writ large. Right. 
but it also, um, so not only does it sort of carry on that tradition, but I also think it builds upon it too. Um, so, so I think for me, I mean, that's where I think the multimodal has helped me to think through the print and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think thinking about voice, thinking about accessibility and thinking about audience in very nuanced, complicated kind of ways. Oh, cool. Okay. I mean, I've, my head's bubbling with different kinds of ideas right now. Just real quickly, do you know the book Summer of Her Baldness? No, I don't. It's, um, it's kind of a weird one to think of right now, but it's a woman who is at Irvine, professor in English, and it's about um, her dealing with cancer treatments. And so it is, as print goes, sort of an experimental slash academic text really was really, really rich for me in thinking about um, some of these things. I mean, I know you've got tons of resources from the angles you're coming at, but that was, somebody showed me that book, thinking about academic, books that walk that academic um, line. Anyway, yeah. that was just the first thing that came to mind, so sorry. No, that's great. <laughs> but, I'm going to check that one out, if actually. I think of, uh, if I find other stuff that's the first one that comes to mind but we've we've gone well over time um okay. <laughs> this has been really delightful yes and, I, and thank you <laughs> yeah no well thanks for being patient with us figuring this out um and and for having the solution um and and my fingers are crossed that this has indeed worked because i you know i'm curious now about this machine actually having recorded a full half hour of full screen video, you know, in any way that's useful, but we, we can, tr you know, we've been trying this for both ends. So I guess, um, we'll hang up. I'll check on how the video looks and goes and I'll get back to you. And, um, you know, if you think about things you wanted to have said, I, I know, oh, no, that always happens after an interview, like, oh, damn, <laughs> there was this. Um, you know, we could always, this, now that, we, that I know how to do this, we can do this really easily. So um, let's just check into that. But otherwise, have a lovely day. Good luck with all that writing. Thank you. And I'll be seeing you. Yes, sounds okay. great. great. All right. Thanks, Melanie. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.